Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for the second projections model workshop by the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences. For those of you that weren't with us for the first workshop, I'm Halal Isa, an epidemiologist by training and practice. I'm an assistant professor of public health practice at the Faculty of Public Health at Kuwait University and a visiting scientist at the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. As you may know, we had our first workshop on May, on May 14th, where the total lockdown in Kuwait had just started. For that workshop, several scholars from KU and Pyatt presented their COVID-19 prediction models, as well as the opinion of experts from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation in the state of Washington. Today, although the COVID-19 daily statistics are similar to those we had seven weeks ago, the situation in Kuwait is quite a bit different than it was back then. So the economy has slowly been kick-started last week, shopping malls are open and mosques are back in business under certain guidelines, but we still live under a partial lockdown or curfew. In addition, the lockdown that has been imposed on a couple of areas, specifically Al Mahbula and Jalib, which are heavily populated with mostly migrant blue collar workers for more than 10 weeks, had been lifted. If we look at other countries that have peaked before Kuwait and have somewhat rushed to reopen their economies, some are going through a second peak right now and have therefore traced back their steps in banning indoor dining and large gatherings, as well as mandating the use of face masks and, and social distancing. In addition, our knowledge of the virus and how it is transmitted is also constantly being updated. So two days ago, for example, a group of 239 scientists from all over the world have urged the WHO to acknowledge that the virus is airborne. So what does all of this mean for Kuwait? What do we know and what can we expect? Keeping all those moving parts in mind and coupling them with the issue of data availability and data quality, our speakers today have both done some very interesting, remarkable work in trying to either model the COVID-19 pandemic in Kuwait and explain the complexity of its heterogeneity within such a small country like Kuwait. So, Without further ado, I would like to present our first speaker, which is Dr. Abdullah Shimiri. He is part of a team of researchers from the Sman Diabetes Institute and KU who have developed a predictive mathematical model that takes demographics and geographical distribution into consideration, stimulating the current reality in Kuwait and thereby enabling a preliminary evaluation of any containment strategy before its application. Dr. Shimiri is an assistant professor of mathematics at the Faculty of Science at KU, and he will present the model on behalf of the research team. He has obtained his doctorate of philosophy in mathematical biology from the University of Oxford in 2014. As a researcher, he is interested in exploring the interface of mathematics, physics, and biology, and his research topics are focused on applied mathematics, mathematical modeling, mathematical biology, homogenization, and dynamical systems. So, Abdullah, Dr. Abdullah, I'll turn it over to you right now. Thank you. Uh, thanks to um, KFAS for uh, hosting this, uh, arranging and hosting this workshop. Um, um, so let's uh, start the, um, the talk. Um, I'm going to be uh, giving a talk about a, um, a work I've been doing with uh, researchers at the Desman Institute and Kuwait University, uh, collaborators from the Ministry of Health, and then highlight um, some of the challenges, successes, um, the knowledge gaps, and uh, some of the future directions which we uh, aim to uh, uh, follow. All right. Okay, so um, just a just a brief uh, mention of what predictive disease modeling is all well, not all about, just some of the examples for its uses, or at least what you know I am uh, interested in. Uh, well, we use it um, for uh, disease prevalence calculation, estimation of disease prevalence, uh, estimation of 
uh, epidemic wave durations uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of public health interventions uh, to optimize the, um, the timing of those interventions and also um, estimate the burden of the healthcare system as in the burden of the epidemic. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll start off by uh, talking about the knowledge gaps here in Kuwait. Uh, and uh, these present um, an immense challenge on uh, modelers. Uh, the first is basically, uh, uh, we, ha we have no national studies or reports about the contact structure of the subpopulations in Kuwait, no comprehensive studies. Um, these are really important if we were to understand uh, the dynamics of the uh, transmission in certain geographic areas and also the dynamics of the uh, transmission among different uh, age groups. Uh, also, there is no national reports on the overall and COVID weekly death counts. So other countries are actively doing that. Uh, not just COVID-19, also general death trends. Um, uh, we don't currently have accurate and comprehensive reports on the hospitalization counts, uh, including ICUs. So we have multiple hospitals in Kuwait, including field hospitals. Um, we are not sure where the data are coming from. Is it from certain hospital or all hospitals? So uh, again, there is a sense of um, confusion here, so we don't have that. Um, and you'll see in a minute why these are important for modeling. Now, up to this point, I haven't seen uh, a national report on temporal uh, seroprevalence data, okay? And this is really important work, like field work. I mean, modeling, you know, is important, but without field work, um, it's, it's hard to make um, sensible long-term predictions. So uh, we don't have that yet. Um, we have uh, fellow epidemiologists who've done field work, and I think it's worth, you know, exploring their expertise to do that, and also do like other countries, uh, publish the seroprevalence data bi-weekly or at least uh, monthly. That will push the modeling forward. Um, there are no national reports on the epidemic progression. Um, so far, we're only tracking what we are testing. Um, we're not tracking uh, field data, like sort of prevalence data. Uh, in Italy, uh, they have done temporal tracking of random testing, as in swaps, rather than the reported cases. In a uh, one of the municipal municipalities there. It's, it's one of the uh, most interesting and important studies that has ever been published since April. Um, so to, to track the epidemic, we need that sort of field data to understand uh, the true impact of the epidemic and whether you know we're getting any type of uh, community uh, immunity and whether the transmission is actually being curbed. Uh, there's a lack of uh, studies on reporting delays. Uh, as far as I know, um, many countries and many groups are actively doing that. Uh, uh, reporting has characteristic delays, and that needs to be uh, covered, studied uh, extensively in research. So I haven't seen anything locally. And these are also important in modeling. Uh, there is no data on frequency distribution of um, clinically important durations, such as onset of symptoms to hospitalization, hospitalization to death, hospitalization to recovery. That's worth also uh, doing. It's important for the modeling uh, of the uh, healthcare burden. Um, now, um, I'm going to move to the modeling pitfalls, and that... It, that basically includes both statistical and mathematical modeling. Assumption of static policies, that's one of the uh, major pitfalls. I mean, we call them dynamic models to be dynamic, just like the policies are dynamic. Also, um, the human behavior is also dynamic. So 
assuming it's static, that's, that's a, it's, it's a major assumption, and we think of it as a pitfall. Assuming biology is static, um, uh, basically um, assuming that certain interventions have exaggerated effectiveness. We've seen that in the literature uh, lately, and by interventions here, I mean mitigating interventions. Uh, people think that masks can reduce up to 90 or 80 percent of the, uh, uh, the transmission. So uh, that's, that's an exaggerated uh, assumption. Um, not accounting for population level quarantine. So this is, this is an interesting bit. You'll see it in the model later on. Uh, only a few groups around the world have you know, uh, considered this. Uh, population is divided really into uh, classes, as in class, uh, classes of people who are practicing social distancing or effectively being quarantined uh, based on uh, their response to the governmental policies. Uh, I haven't seen that in, in models. Only a few models have considered it. I'll, I'll talk about this later. Um, another pitfall, uh, which I have seen at least regionally, uh, seen some internationally as well, uh, fitting uh, dynamic models or statistical models to reported cases. Now, uh, reporting is well has certain policies and uh, is fraught with selection bias. Uh, so to fit the model based on uh, you know, reported cases is basically missing a large portion of the epidemic outbreak. There are other parts of the outbreak that need to be accounted for. And testing only captures you know, uh, a part of it. So um, also fitting based on cumulative trends, uh, this works for, uh, in terms of accuracy, um, for about a week, give or take. So it's really for a short-term prediction. Um, assuming the dynamics of transmission are purely statistical, so it is well known that there are biological um, uh, factors affecting the transmission, uh, nonlinear biological dynamics, uh, feedback loops, there's an element of seasonality if we ever get to that medium term uh, part of the epidemic. Also, uh, we've seen this, uh, number nine, we've seen it in the US and also in Kuwait and Saudi, uh, pulling national data, right? To think of the country as a homogeneous mix and look at uh, the whole national curve rather than subpopulation curves. Now, we, we, we have evidence of heterogeneous transmission, also heterogeneous response to policies, different policies in different geographic areas. So you'll see that in the future directions uh, uh, part of the talk. And uh, lastly is basically the naive calculation of the uh, effective or time varying reproduction number. Now, once we have selection bias, okay, uh, then calculation of RT uh, really is no longer um, representative of the picture of the outbreak. Um, for example, uh, in Kuwait, we have uh, isolated certain areas, total population of about 1 million, and announced that no uh, swap testing will be done there. So uh, again, uh, and other areas that are not isolated, there, are, there is swap testing. So when it comes to reporting, uh, it's obvious that there is a selection bias here and the, the true impact of the epidemic in the isolated areas, uh, there's, there's a lot of question marks about where is it, how is it being tracked or registered. Uh, also, we've seen the, uh, the, uh, the selection bias, for example, when we uh, look at the apparent divergence between the discovery rate of infected people and uh, the RT trend. The RT trend, the trend is kind of dropping, but the uh, discovery rate is uh, more or less flat. That, that all happened by the second week of May, and we think it could be a change due to a change in uh, uh, policy. So uh, this is also a pitfall, just to look at RT curves and think, you know, things are fine. Um, that's only a part of the picture and not the whole thing. 
Um, now I'm going to talk uh, briefly about what I've uh, done with my team. Uh, started back early March, and uh, we published on uh, mid-April uh, a report. Uh, sorry, a draft study. So this is really uh, the prediction based on uh, the policies and the data back then, uh, assuming things, policies, interventions would remain more or less uh, unchanged. So what was the purpose of the study? Uh, well, the idea is since the start, the country uh, tried to, well, move to curb and contain the spread of the, uh, the epidemic in Kuwait. So uh, what we did as a team, uh, we developed a mathematical framework based on uh, the demographics of Kuwait and the course of public health interventions. Uh, and the idea was to simulate the potential trajectories of the outbreak in Kuwait. And then we used that framework to also test or evaluate how effective were some of the interventions in uh, curbing the outbreak. Uh, this is really a timeline of the uh, public health interventions. Uh, as you can see, there, there's a lot of them. Uh, very, some of them are very strict. Uh, there's also um, an element of a quick response. You can see uh, first case reported was, I think, in the 24th or 25th of February. Uh, one, we have the response the first day, uh, sorry, a few days afterward, which, uh, afterwards, which was the, the closure of schools and universities. Um, it took about a month to see the first death in Kuwait in the modeling community. When that happens, we know we have somewhere between two and five weeks delay to see the death. So this basically places the first community transmission around end of February, early March. Okay, so what is the modeling framework? I'm going to talk briefly about it. So there are two elements to the framework. There is a statistical element. Uh, we call it an observational model, okay? Uh, we basically look at the reported cases, uh, whether, you know, confirmed infections or death cases, and assume that they are being drawn from a negative binomial distribution. Um, so the, the reporting is distributed rather than, uh, you know, uh, fixed on a straight line. Um, disease transmission was assumed to be deterministic following an epidemiologic um, model, the SEIR model, with additional compartments for uh, testing dynamics and clinical dynamics. Now, as the patient or the individual is move, moves from one compartment to the other, um, the movement is characterized by transition rates, uh, examples like transmission rate, recovery rate, uh, incubation period, hospitalization rate, and so on and so forth. So this is the uh, basic model structure. We have three stages. We have the transmission stage. And then we have the uh, testing, uh, contact tracing, isolation dynamics. And then we have uh, a picture of the early hospitalization dynamics. And um, here you have the symbols on the other side explaining what each compartment contains. Uh, these are the mechanistic equations that we were uh, using to um, simulate uh, the epidemic outbreak. So for each compartment, there is a a, an equation that describes the evolution of uh, the numbers of the individuals within the compartment. Now, for parameter estimation, we chose not to follow regression type statistical fitting, fitting of incidence or commutative curves. And I explained that in the common pitfalls uh, bit. Uh, and we do this mainly because the reporting is statistically distributed. So it's important to include that. There, there, there is a lot of variation in reporting, and that's basically inherited by the policy of um, testing. Uh, for estimating the parameters, we use a maximum likelihood framework uh, to estimate the 
reproduction number, the basic reproduction number, the effective reproduction number. Uh, the method we use is, this is really standard uh, methodology. Uh, we use another MEAD uh, method to optimize. Uh, we basically, once we, start, once we get our simulations, we generate a simulation-based 95% uh, credible intervals, okay? Um, basically, we draw a parameters from a normal distribution that is based on the maximum likelihood framework. Um, and then we run our simulations for about 10,000 times, and uh, the initial 1,000 is just an initial burnout we leave out. So this is pretty uh, standard in the field. Now, what are the assumptions for um, kickstarting the model? Well, based on national policies here in Kuwait, uh, particularly stay home orders and uh, avoiding gatherings and so on and so forth, we've divided the population into two subgroups, a protected and unprotected group. Our initial estimates were based on about a 500,000 to uh, 1 million point five individuals who are unprotected. And that was a, a very close number to uh, the early outbreak geographically. Uh, as, I mean, you remember what happened in the isolated areas and the number of the population was somewhere between 1 to 1 1.5 million. So we thought this is what's leading the uh, outbreak. Uh, we've seen a similar approach uh, used elsewhere, other modeling groups around the world, particularly British Columbia, Canada. They were doing something similar on uh, population classes uh, that follow certain social distancing guidelines and those who don't. Um, so in terms of the assumptions uh, about the policies, um, we assume that from the beginning until the end of the simulations, the trends we're observing in testing, contact tracing, and isolation uh, remain the same. Uh, we assume that the hospitalization policies, for example, duration of the hospitalization, case definitions, recovery, uh, definition of death, they all remain the same um, until the end of the simulation. Uh, the the parameters we used to kickstart the optimization were a reproduction, a basic reproduction number of three, okay? Um, and then we use an effective parameter, kappa, 0.5, which converts the uh, reproduction number to an effective repro reproduction number. The assumption here is that the period we're studying, we assume that the, the effective reproduction number is the average one over that period, so it's sort of a constant. And we're assuming that an effective uh, intervention would lead to uh, a kappa, which is a fraction less than one, after the implementation of the intervention. And in particular, we're interested in partial curfew. Uh, the partial curfew was set to begin on the 22nd of March. Uh, the initial uh, disease seeding was set at one individual on the 25th of um, uh, February. Uh, these are the simulations that we had back uh, in April. Um, the scenarios are for a 500,000 and uh, 1 million point five uh, unprotected individuals, and uh, the uh, the shading here represents the uh, credibility intervals. The model was suggesting that if we were to overcome this wave, then we'll see a peak somewhere around um, the second half of May, first half of uh, June. Uh, you can also see um, the hospitalization burden, what to expect in terms of uh, hospitalization based on the data and the policies that were uh, presented back then. Now, this is all um, a summary of what we get from those curves. And again, these are give or take numbers. They're not really exact numbers. So they're giving you ranges. I'd focus on the ranges. 
so the burden, the epidemic burden we were expecting, for example, for case of only 500,000 unprotected individuals, somewhere between 300 to uh, about 680, whereas for a million point five, uh, somewhere between 800 and 2,000. Also, you can see there is a, a prediction for the healthcare burden, the hospital occupancy and the ICU occupancy for the two cases scenarios. Also, the mortality, we'll get back to this later on, and the, uh, the peak uh, expectation. In terms of evaluating the effectiveness of the interventions, we're focused, we, we focused on the partial curfew and whether it was, uh, it was uh, it, we were able to reduce the effective reproduction number way below the uh, basic reproduction number. Now, um, we didn't see much and much difference before and after the partial curfew in terms of the effective reproduction number based on the model. It's about one point, uh, well, somewhere between 1.33 to 1.58. Um, now, calculation of reproduction number requires knowing uh, the distribution of the incubation period and the infection periods. So your calculation depends on that biology. So if I use different incubation infection periods, switch from two and three to five and six, you get a higher reproduction number. So it's not just a pure statistical thing. We need to include the biology to calculate that and you can see a reflection, but in both cases, the reproduction number and the effective one are more or less the same. Now, uh, how about continuation, considering what, what, what has happened since then and the reopening plans and the isolation of certain areas and reopening. Uh, we've seen drastic changes in hospitalization, testing isolation, and public health policies halfway through, uh, particularly, second week of starting from the second week of uh, May. Uh, to track what might happen, for, uh, so track what has happened and forecast what might happen for the progression, uh, we are currently working on incorporating those changes. And you can see here just a sample of what we have. I'm focusing here on death. Now, in terms of future directions, um, so guided by our national reopening plans, uh, we think as a team that it's important to granularize our transmission models and refocus the statistical observational models on clinical rather than epidemiological data sets and wait for uh, field studies, epidemiological field studies about the seroprevalence. Um, we're, we're, at, we're tackling uh, four areas uh, at this point. Um, in modeling terms, a metapopulation mod model, an age-structured model, hospital network model, and risk-structured uh, models. Uh, some examples about the metapopulation models. This is a um, this work has been submitted uh, uh, with a team from uh, Kuwait, uh, the Sman Institute, and the University of Toronto. Uh, we include the demographic and socioeconomic resolution um, of the population uh, to account for heterogeneous contact structure and also cross transmission. Uh, hospital network model is a work in progress uh, with the ministry. Uh, we try to understand the spatial resolution and its impact on uh, the different hospitals. So uh, each hospital will have its own uh, transmission model based on clinical severity dynamics. And then uh, we build a network of hospitals with uh, cross communication uh, done via transfer dynamics or flow dynamics. And the observational model is based on ICU and death uh, cases in each hospital. And this is a sample uh, simulation. Uh, age structure models are also important if we're to understand the, um, the mortality, the impact on uh, the mortality. Uh, different age groups uh, are placed in different risk groups. 
And so um, it is important to include that granular detail into all models, whether network or um, metapopulation or general transmission models. So we want to understand how that impacts um, mortality. So uh, we're including age-specific mortality, age-specific contact rates. Remember I mentioned that as a challenge. Uh, we don't have data on that yet. And also uh, age-specific comorbidities. And this is a sample of uh, the simulations. Um, I'd like to introduce my uh, research team. Okay, so in terms of expertise, we try to bridge um, different expertise that are needed for this particular research. So uh, I'm leading uh, the biomodeling aspects. In terms of clinical aspects, uh, Dr. Hamad al -Yassi. Genetic aspect, Professor Fahad al mullah Public health aspect, uh, Dr. Barak Al-Ahmed. Policy making and health management, Dr. Faisal Al-Rifai and Dr. Qais al -Dwari. Clinical dynamics, um, Dr. Abdullah Shukri, Dr. Mohammed Jamal, and Dr. Salman Al-Sabah. And these are my team members. Uh, Dr. Hamad Yassin from HSC, Kuwait University in Desman Diabetes. Dr. Barak Al-Ahmed from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, Professor Fahd Al-Mullah from DDI. Uh, Dr. Qais Adwari from DDI. Dr. Faisal Rifai from DDI. Dr. Abdullah Shukri. Uh, from Jabir Al Ahmed Hospital, uh, Dr. Mohammed Jamal, HSC Kuwait University, and Jabir Al Ahmed, and uh, Dr. Salman Al Sabah, HSC Kuwait University, and Jabir Al Ahmed Hospital. And thank you all for uh, listening. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Abdullah, for that presentation. That was really um, informative, and it was interesting to see the common pitfalls and what you tried to avoid in your model. Now, I really, we have a lot of questions for you, which we'll keep for the end, but I just have a, um, a quick question regarding um, the R0 and the transmission of the virus, um, like, even after the partial lockdown. So would your conclusion from your model be that the partial lockdown was not effective in reducing the transmission of this virus in Kuwait? The, the partial lockdown, the effect of it, so there is a long-term effect, which is lowering the peak, okay? Mm -hmm. The immediate effect was basically uh, controlling the spread at a, certain, um, at a certain level. So that's what we've seen. In terms of the reduction, Okay. Over that period, we don't see uh, any reduction. So it's maintained. Okay. So um, just from a big picture point of view and just putting it in the entire context of Kuwait and not just public health professionals, mm -hmm. um, in the media, we've seen a lot, and I mean like the formal media, not social media, we've seen a lot of criticism um, towards the Ministry of Health probably and the government as a whole, mm -hmm. that the partial lockdown and the total lockdowns were not um, effective in um, reducing transmission or containing the virus. What would you say to those people which mostly are not trained in public health or have no, I, like, no experience in working in that area and could be talking from other points of views? I mean, based on the work you've done, what would be an answer you'd give or reply um, for those kind of criticisms? Yeah, so I'd say that um, certain policies are not really meant to just, well, to lower the numbers right that on that day or that week, okay? The epidemic curve has a peak. It could be natural. It could be artificial by certain policies. And the idea maybe is to lower that peak to avoid a crash in the uh, healthcare system. Okay, so certain interventions are meant maybe for that purpose and not really to, uh, well, once you have community transmission, it's really hard to bring it down to zero, so that's for sure, okay? Uh, but maybe to bring it down to a maybe controllable level so that you can, uh, you know, uh, sustain your economy at the same time uh, protect your healthcare system. So, 
uh, that's, what, that's what I have to say about uh, all of that. So um, my understanding of it, um, the R not was con sorry, the R E was controlled. Okay, it's it's really it has a mass and a min, and uh, that control, uh, the long term effect of it was just to push the peak, uh, you know, in the future so that we don't uh, see. Uh, crash in the healthcare system. Okay. Thank you, because I've always wondered how um, you could publish certain articles or opinions on the efficacy of certain public health measures without doing, you know, epidemiologic studies of counterfactuals and what would happen had those measures not been in place. Yeah. So um, thank you for your comment, and we have a lot more questions for you yeah. coming up in uh, less than half an hour, so please stay with us. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we'll move on now to our yeah. second speaker of the day, which is um, Ahmed Burbeya. So during the last workshop, Ahmed was also with us. He introduced a prototype random network model to simulate the heterogeneous spread of COVID-19 transmission in Kuwait. Today, he will tell us more about the heterogeneous spread of COVID-19 in Kuwait and the importance of using multiple models for forecasting. Ahmed will discuss how this can be used to stimulate, to simulate intervention strategies such as partial lockdown and curfews. Ahmed is a PhD candidate in statistics at the University of Chicago. He earned his BS in mathematics, um, a minor in computer science, and a master's of science in statistics from Stanford University. His graduate research uses tools from partial differential equations, probability, and combinatorics to solve problems in statistical physics. So, Ahmed, I'll turn, turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, especially to, to KFAS, for organizing this workshop and for uh, encouraging me to, to work on this project and for introducing me to all the local experts in the area. I'm really looking forward to having productive dialogues with, with all of them. Uh, okay, so I will go ahead and start. I, I wanna begin by uh, emphasizing the importance of having multiple models for any prediction problem uh, especially for one as important as COVID-19. And uh, just as evidence of that, uh, every week the United States uh, Center for Disease Control aggregates and releases forecasts for COVID-19 deaths in Kuwait. So over 20 different individual modelers or modeling teams send in forecasts to the CDC, which they then aggregate and uh, display on their website. And uh, what's the point of having 20, 30, 50 models? Why not just pick one really good model? Well, I've been keeping track of uh, the performance of uh, COVID-19 models, uh, especially in the United States and Kuwait. And what I'm showing here is a three-week performance of uh, the models for forecasting COVID-19 deaths in the United States. Just for visual clarity, I'm only showing a small subset of uh, all the different teams. And on the, the y-axis here is percentage error. So if one model says that there is going to be 100 deaths in the next three weeks, but the actual number of deaths is zero, then the percent error is 100%. Uh, 100 I, I don't remember what I just said, but uh, it's it's just a measure of, of how well and how poorly some uh, model, modeling teams do. And uh, I want you to notice that there's a baseline model. And in this case, the baseline model is that the total number of deaths in the next three weeks is exactly the total number of deaths in the last three weeks. And notice that sometimes this very simple baseline model beats other very sophisticated, complicated models. And uh, why do we look at 50, 30, 60 models? Well, once we have enough forecasts 
and assuming that every forecast is not bad, the median or the middle forecast is provably better than every single individual forecast. And I've plotted here on the exact same plot as the previous slide, the median, which is a black dot. And you can notice that the median does better than every individual model does week to week. So how about doing something like this for Kuwait? Well, I, I've been keeping track of international models for Kuwait. And uh, also I've been keeping track of their progress and their performance. Just as a simple, uh, just some simple evidence of model performance. Uh, let's look at the number of COVID-19 deaths in Kuwait between the period of June 3rd and June 24th. The actual number of deaths, new deaths in that period was 104. The IHME model predicted 515. MIT predicted 329. The YYG model, uh, Yu Yang Gu, uh, predicted 180. And Los Alamos National Lab predicted 126. So on June 3rd, they made that prediction of 126 deaths, and there were, actual, and there were actually 104. So that's very, very close. And uh, not just for that one example I showed, week to week, Los Alamos National Lab has been the best performing model for Kuwait so far. But on May 27th, Los Alamos National Lab forecasted 213 deaths in Kuwait by July 6th today. And they had a 99% confidence interval of 189 to 313. Uh, today, there are a total of 373 reported COVID-19 deaths in Kuwait. So what, what went wrong? Well, all of these different international models, uh, international uh, organizations, produce forecasts for essentially every single other country in the world week to week. And they're almost always based in the United States or some European country. So they don't really understand the complexities and unique characteristics of every single country that they're modeling. In particular for Kuwait, essentially all of all that these organizations see are the, the weekly number of COVID infections or COVID-19 uh, related uh, clinical data in Kuwait. So this is a picture that they see. Uh, total number of new cases by contact per week. And uh, on June, sort of the beginning of June, May 27th, the, the time that, would, that Los Alamos National Lab made the prediction that the deaths would go down, you can see that there's a downward trend in the data. And uh, their model realized that, and so the total number of deaths uh, were lower than what they were before. But if we look at the exact same data, except we stratify the infections by nationality, so this, uh, the black bar represents a total number of daily new cases per week among uh, expatriates, and the uh, light green bar is the total number of cases per week among Kuwaiti nationals. And when the two bars overlap, it's a dark green color, and uh, next, what we're going to do is we're going to normalize by the population difference. There, there's a 70 to 30% ratio between Kuwaitis and non-Kuwaitis. And once we do that, the picture looks completely different. The curve for uh, non-Kuwaitis went up and then down, but the curve for Kuwaitis went up. So the same data can paint, can paint two completely different pictures. And international uh, models aren't incorporating this into their predictions. And this is indeed important. There's a lot of uh, evidence for heterogeneity in Kuwait. And uh, several recent KFAS funded research articles demonstrate a difference in both clinical outcomes, disease, disease spread, so the way the disease spreads. Migrant workers are more packed. Uh, Kuwaitis tend to live in houses by themselves and COVID-19 morbidities between Kuwaiti and non-Kuwaiti demographics. So the, the average uh, 
for example, the average BMI for a Kuwaiti, uh, one of these studies found is slightly higher than the average uh, BMI of a non-Kuwaiti. And that's been, uh, there's evidence for that being comorbidity for COVID-19. And uh, this may provide a biological reason for why we should look at uh, heterogeneous models. So models that differentiate between uh, the different demographics in Kuwait. Uh, I, I started uh, studying COVID-19 data in Kuwait at the beginning of February. I was still in Chicago at the time uh, taking classes. But cases were rising in Chicago then. And uh, I was sure that they would rise in Kuwait. So I started to look at the, the best ways that we could model uh, COVID-19 in Kuwait. And I, I, I knew since then that it's important to acknowledge the difference in disease spread between Kuwaitis and non-Kuwaitis because I, I lived in Kuwait for a lot of my life and uh, non-Kuwaitis have a very different lifestyle than Kuwaitis, or at least some of them do. Uh, and they're and they're different. And I and I've looked at different ways that we can model heterogeneous disease spread. And the first uh, model I looked at was an SIR type deterministic differential equation model, uh, which is uh, sort of what we saw in the previous talk. And we can very easily make that model heterogeneous by adding more compartments and considering uh, vector outputs of the differential equations model. And the main benefit of, of this is that it's pretty easy to do and it's very interpretable. Interpretable. It has a biological backing. And you can model simple interventions by uh, sort of changing a parameter in the model, changing a 0.1 to a 0.5. That's what a lot of uh, teams have been doing. And the main, main drawback of these differential equations model is that they're difficult to fit. And then for that reason, they're not so good at short-term forecasts unless you have a hybrid uh, differential equations model. But uh, for many of these models, you need to make assumptions on certain parameters because otherwise uh, the optimization problem for a differential equation SIR type model is intractable. C certain parameters depend linearly on other parameters. Uh, for example, I, I looked at an SIR model where I had uh, separate apartments for Kuwaitis and non-Kuwaitis, and I fit the Kuwaiti data, just COVID-19 data, to that model. And the model learned that there was zero interaction between Kuwaitis and non-Kuwaitis, which we all know is not true. But that, that's just one example of how difficult it is to predict with, to, to fit a, an SIR differential equations model. And the second approach, which is what I talked about in the last workshop, is an agent-based uh, stochastic compartmental model, which essentially tries to uh, imitate how disease spreads at the microscopic level. And the main benefit of this is that it's very easily interpretable and it's very flexible uh, since it's probabilistic and agent-based. Uh, the code can be updated very easily and you can use it to model intricate intervention strategies like locking down certain areas of Kuwait, uh, incorporating different test, trace, and quarantine uh, strategies. Uh, so I, I spent a while looking at these two models. These are both knowledge-based models and, the, and knowledge-based models require input from experts. And I, I'm not an epidemiologist. My, my background is in math and statistics. And uh, for that reason, maybe that's why the, the models that I, I made uh, didn't do that well. But there's a third approach to modeling heterogeneous disease spread. And that's through machine learning. So it's just, and that's just to view COVID-19 as a prediction problem. Uh, a sort of a, a classical machine learning problem is can you train a machine to detect a picture of a cat? So if you give a, a computer an image, does it have a cat or not? This is a, a classic machine learning problem. So predicting COVID-19 cases, that's also a machine learning problem. And so we can leverage 
uh, the thousands of already existing uh, machine learning models and then quickly test all of them on COVID-19 data using all available data and features. And we don't even need to think about domain-specific knowledge. And that, that pro is also a con. So the main con of machine learning uh, type models is that they're not always interpretable and training can be tricky and take a very long time. Uh, sometimes even weeks. And it's difficult to trust long-term forecasts which come from a machine learning model that you can't understand. And for this talk, I'm going to discuss some of my work on the machine learning approach. And essentially the machine learning approach makes one big assumption, which is almost always not true, which is that the past looks like the future. So it's, it's sometimes close to being true, but never exactly true. And what does it mean that the past looks like the future? Well, there, that there exists some function of the past so that given the past, we can predict the future. But this is not always true. Could anyone have predicted 2020? Uh, maybe Bill Gates, but definitely not me. But when this big assumption is true, given enough data, machine learning will provably find this function f. This is a classical, not classical, but it's a foundational uh, theorem of machine learning, of neural networks. So what's the machine learning approach? Well, the definition of machine learning is, well, one definition is to extract information directly from historical data and then extrapolate to make predictions, incorporating no specific domain knowledge. So our goal is to develop a model that performs well for new unseen data. And the way we assess um, uh, any model is to divide our given data set into two parts. So the first part is a training set which we use to choose and train the model. And the second part is a test set, which we use to evaluate a one model or more. And uh, this is what the pipeline looks like for forecasting. We first pick a model class or several different model classes. So either regression models, decision tree ensembles, artificial neural networks. If you don't know what these names are, it's fine. These are just machine learning models. You can think of them as black boxes that each have their own strengths and weaknesses. And then once we pick a model class, we need to decide what features are relevant. For example, Kuwaiti cases yesterday, total non-Kuwaiti cases last week. And then we need to decide on an outcome goal. For example, predicting cases for next week, next month, or next year, because different models will be better at predicting uh, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And uh, this is the COVID-19 prediction challenge in Kuwait. Uh, our goal is to find a model that given all data, all COVID-19 data in Kuwait, except for the last four weeks, uh, to essentially predict as closely as possible uh, COVID, uh, daily COVID cases by contact in the last four weeks. And our, our goal is to assess uh, short-term, mid-term, and long-term horizons of models. I, I, I want to take a second to just look at this picture. Could any human look at, the de look at the curve before the red line and predict exactly what happens after the red line? M most likely not. Maybe a domain expert would have noticed uh, cases rising among Kuwaitis and then predicted that uh, there would be exponential growth among Kuwaitis, which would uh, linearly factor into the daily cases. But the nice thing about machine learning is that we don't need to worry about that. We just need to feed in as much data as we can into the model and see if it does that automatically on its own. So I, I looked at uh, short-term, mid-term, and long-term forecasting performance of of three different classes of machine learning models. You can't really see very clearly in this figure, but I, I can tell you what happened. Uh, and one of the models did really well at performing, uh, at predicting 
uh, new cases uh, in one week from now. And the models did okay at predicting cases in two weeks from now, but all of the models did really badly at predicting cases for the next four weeks. And some of the models actually realized that given the data that I fed into them, which was cases, uh, daily COVID cases uh, from Kuwaitis and daily COVID cases among non-Kuwaitis, that given that essentially really small amount of data, the best predictor for the next four weeks is just a completely flat line. So the, the total number of cases the next four weeks is going to be the exact number of cases in the last four weeks. That predictor ended up being the best for these individual models for four weeks. And this is what uh, the mean absolute error was. So some model did well for one week prediction, some model, another model did well for two week prediction, but none of them really did well for four, four week prediction. But I, I sort of rushed through that because I didn't want to stop at two features. I didn't want to just include Kuwaiti cases and non-Kuwaiti cases. And I could do that because of this specific machine learning model called a neural network, which automatically incorporates feature engineering into prediction. The neural network automatically decides what features are relevant for prediction and, which, and what are not relevant. And this accelerates the process, and it often yields more accurate predictions than other machine learning problems. And the main downside to neural networks, aside from not being interpretable, is uh, the really, really long training times and that it's difficult to assess uncertainty. Uh, incorporating prediction intervals and not point estimates into neural nets is an active area of research. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, neural networks are uh, this machine learning model uh, that's vaguely inspired by the biology of the brain, but just from a mathematical perspective, a neural network is, is really simple. It's just a nonlinear function, and the function itself is a composition of individual intermediate functions, which are called layers. So there's some input layer, so we feed in data through the input layer, and then there's some hidden layer, one or more hidden layers, and then the model does its own magic in those hidden layers, and then the outputs uh, what you wanted to predict. In our case, COVID-19 cases in Kuwait. And what about deep learning? Some of you may have heard this, this, this phrase before. All deep learning is, is using a large number of layers, say more than three in a neural network. And well, we, we looked at building a deep learning model for pr predicting COVID-19 cases in Kuwait. For the experts in the audience, the framework we used was uh, TensorFlow and Python. Would, and uh, we use a GPU accelerated uh, library. And the specific uh, neural net which we used was a feed forward neural network with four hidden layers and a switch activation function. Uh, not important if you don't know what those words mean. But the important thing is that deep learning models automatically learn and automatically decide what's useful. So it only knows what we give it, but given enough, it can essentially learn anything. So we fed into a, a deep learning model, all available COVID-19 clinical data in Kuwait, ICU cases, deaths, testing, intervention measures uh, as ordinal consonants, uh, Google mobility reports, and then several other features, which we could think of, uh, including last year's uh, Kuwait flu data. We got this uh, from the World Health Organization. And uh, I mean, again, the nice thing about this is we don't even have to think about whether or not this is relevant. The model determines it automatically. And uh, since maybe temperature could be relevant, we also included average daily temperature. And uh, we, we pulled this from uh, climate uh, observation uh, department in the U.S. And I just looking at this graph, all, all we see is that it's hot in the summer and cool in the winter. 
but the model doesn't know that on its own. But given this, now it knows that. And another uh, interesting thing that we, we fed into the model, interesting to me at least, are total number of COVID-19 cases stratified by day of the week. And uh, what this plot is here, uh, the y-axis is the percentage change from the average number of cases reported uh, per day of the week, where zero is a baseline. And above zero means that you report more cases on average, below zero means you report fewer cases on average. And we found that on Monday, at least for Kuwaitis, there were many, many fewer COVID-19 cases reported than any other day of the week. And uh, we, we found that on Friday there, there, and Sunday, there were many more COVID-19 cases reported for Kuwaitis. And uh, this is what, what, what it looks like for non-Kuwaitis. There's a uh, sort of interesting difference in the distribution between the two demographics. And we can think of reasons for why these distributions are what they are. Maybe uh, hospitals uh, take breaks over the weekend and then report a lot of cases on Sunday and fewer cases on Monday. But at the very least, now the model knows this. And another, another thing I looked at was the time of the daily Ministry of Health COVID-19 press conference. And I started to look at this because I've been uh, manually inputting all of the uh, COVID-19 uh, data that the Ministry of Health uh, releases daily. And sometimes uh, the Ministry of Health uh, press conference is a bit late. And I noticed that whenever they're late, the total number of cases is higher than, than usual. And, and I, I did just a, a basic correlation analysis just for fun. And I, and I noticed that there's a mild positive correlation and the deviation from the usual press conference time, which is around 2 p.m., and an increase in daily cases. And uh, this is something I fed into the model. Okay, so I, I discussed some of the features that I fed into the machine learning model. And then I, I performed the same assessment as I did for the other models from before. So I fit and validated the model on everything except for the last four weeks of COVID-19 data. And I looked at how it performed on the last four weeks. And you can see that the blue line here is the model forecast prediction, but the model did much better than the other models. It, the, the mean absolute error was, was much lower. And it did well, not just for one week predictions, but for the entire time period. And this is uh, the forecast of the model. I, I was when I when the model uh, first spit this out. I was kind of shocked. What? What? How? How could it know that the number of cases are going down? And I mean, these models are not interpretable. You can't look at the coefficients and see what it put more weight on, because there are many different layers. But I, I could guess that the model realized that COVID nineteen cases in other countries around the world uh, go up and then go down. But we don't need to worry about that. All we need to do is uh, assess performance of the model on past data, and it seemed to have done well. I don't know if I personally believe this forecast, but I definitely think that this deep learning approach is, is promising. And I'm planning to add more features into the model and then eventually uh, release the predictions weekly. Thank you for listening. Um, so that was very interesting and it gave us um, a deeper look into the different types of models and why it's important to look at more than one. Um, so there are several questions for both speakers, but bef before we go into them, I just want to thank their attend the attendees for all their attention so far. And I just want to notify you that both presentations are available to be downloaded in the handout section um, that you see on the right-hand side of the screen. 
So um, before we answer the questions of, um, from, the part, from the attendees, I'd like to ask you, Ahmed, a question. First of all, I thought it was really interesting, the correlation or slightly positive correlation between the time of the press conference. I thought about that too earlier, but I, I, I didn't do any statistical analysis with it. So that was funny. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is the number of tests and how do you take that into consideration when you model or use the different modeling techniques um, We've seen the number of swabs um, range from, you know, slightly above 2,000 to more than 4,000. And obviously that plays a role. The more you test people, the more positive cases you'll, you'll have. Um, so how do you deal with that? Yeah, there, there, there are two different ways of dealing with it. And the first is the, the knowledge-based approach, which is more on the epidemiology side. And that, that's building your model to, to recognize deficiencies in testing, to recognize that testing has to go up for cases to go up. And that, that's really complicated. And I, I'm not an epidemiologist, so this is why I like the machine learning approach more. And all I need to do is to put, to put in testing data. And then the model determines whether or not it's relevant. Okay. But And then the model that I looked at before I... I, I, I incorporated testing into sort of the dynamics of the model. And that's, that's okay. difficult to tune. So, yeah. Okay. So since uh, we're on that topic, there's another question from me, for you from Abdullah uh, on a similar topic. So as per the Ministry of Health protocol, they are not swabbing patients who are symptomatic unless they are admitted to the hospital. Of course, they are swapping asymptomatic Kuwaitis in the community, but less for non-Kuwaitis. How does that affect the models? Okay. Uh, yeah, so th th this, of course, leads to more cases among Kuwaitis. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why we, we, we saw a rise uh, in cases among Kuwaitis. And I, I, I think that trying to, it's a really difficult problem to determine uh, in the knowledge-based approach what features are critical for models and what are not. Because if you add in too many complexities into the model, it, be, it turns into an intractable problem where you can't estimate the parameters. And and I, I definitely think that increases in testing among Kuwaitis is important, but how does that factor into forecasting? Well, we don't know, is the ministry going to test more non-Kuwaitis in the future? In that case, cases among non-Kuwaitis will go up. It's, it, it's a difficult problem, which I don't have a good answer for. Okay, so yeah, and it's understandable. I mean, and it's very relevant right now since they're lifting the, or lifted already the, um, the two isolated areas, um, so they're uh, back incorporated into society, Mahbula wal Jalib, and they've been under lockdown for a very long time. So, and if there's no testing there, what does that mean for the rest of the population when we're all interacting together, you know, at work or at home, at businesses? Um, so that's a very important question, and I'm afraid we're going to find the answer the hard way <laughs> over the next month. Inshallah, let this, you know. Yeah. So um, there is a question from you for, uh, for you from Dr. Abdullah Shimri, our first speaker. His answer is: Do we know if his question is: Do we know if seasonality is important for transmission force calculations? I, I can tell you that IHME thinks it's important, and they mm -hmm. they uh, claim to have evidence of. Uh, correlation between pneumonia seasonality and mm -hmm. COVID-19 transmission worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, I, I don't know if that's reliable. I, the, the problem with, with all of this data is that it's real-time science. Exactly. All of this stuff is being done day to day, week to week. There are lots of times mistakes. I, I definitely think that it should be looked at carefully. Okay. But 
I don't know if it's important. Okay. Okay, that's great. And we have a question from Barak. Um, so how is it possible to account for misclassification of deaths and cases by nationality in Kuwait, um, the underreporting issue mainly? And what if we have reason to believe that very few tests are done for non-Kuwaitis? The learners could be fed with wrong assortment of cases. Yeah, th th this is why we, we need uh, data on testing exactly. separated by demographic, which we don't have publicly right now. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah. if, if we, we do have that, uh, and we do have detailed uh, breakdowns of demographics and deaths to testing cases, then, then the model can, can try to, to avoid this, this problem of misclassification. But okay. it's, it's, yeah, still tough. Um, and there's another question from Dr. Jihad. Um, this question is, when calculating R0, what is the mean and standard deviation of the serial interval? And why are you selecting these values? Yeah, I, I want to answer this, this. I want to answer a more general question, which is, how do you determine uh, the assumptions that you feed into any epidemiological model of COVID-19? And the answer is you look at other countries where they have done clinical studies of, uh, and you, you use their parameters. Uh, the, <clears throat> there's actually a, a, a website, Kaggle.com, that uses machine learning to aggregate like all of the thousands of different uh, papers on COVID-19 and all of the different parameter estimations that all of these thousands of uh, researchers have done. And I just look at that website and that website gives you sort of the, okay. usually the, the correct answer to these, these parameter questions. Okay, yeah. sounds like a nice tool to have. Yeah, um, Kaggle, I, I can type it in the chat if someone, kaggle.com. Thank you. Um, the next question, or I think we have two more questions before we move on to Dr. Abdullah Shimmeri. So, um, Ahmed, what is the feasibility of including spatial features to these models, given that the situation, in particular the living structure, differs greatly by neighborhood? So we have people that live in single family homes, and then we have people that actually share beds, uh, meaning that one person rents a bed for 12 hours and then the other person rents it for the next 12 hours. Yeah, yeah. This is something that, which, that can be captured by an agent-based model. So if we have that information on a national level, that we have that granular of an information on the national level, we can put that into an agent-based model. And then my personal belief is that the microscopic agent-based model will be the best predictor uh, long-term for COVID-19 in Kuwait. Okay. And that's, that's because of uh, evidence that I've looked at for agent-based models for previous pandemics. And I've also talked to some some of the ex some experts in the area about this, and that's what they told me. Okay. Um, so there are still a few more questions, but I'd like to switch to Dr. Abdullah Shimri because we have a lot of questions <laughs> for him, and then um, I guess we'll go back and forth from there. So, um, Dr. Abdullah, there's a question for you from um, Dari Rashid. So given um, the information gaps, have you considered a Bayesian framework for estimation where non-sample information about population and spatial characteristics is uh, fed as a prior and the posterior density is updated as more information becomes available? Yeah, that's uh, it's a great question. Uh, a lot of the model groups around the world uh, have been doing so, uh, but that also requires some uh, data for the framework, particularly um, uh, reporting delays. Unfortunately, in Kuwait, we lack that sort of data, but it's definitely something we're actively pushing our um, colleagues to, to work on. Um, many of the modern groups around the world are collaborating with um, uh, clinicians and epidemiologists who are uh, publishing that sort of data. 
and that's helping uh, the modeling side, uh, the modeling side to be pushed forward. So it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, framework. Uh, at, at least it's one of the alternatives, but it, it requires some data on uh, reporting days. Okay. Thank you. There's another question from Hamid. Um, are you aware of the criteria used in Kuwait to count COVID-19 deaths? Um, okay, so, uh, okay. Right, so here I'm going to talk, to talk about the selection bias that we are observing. And then I tell you about uh, what I think of uh, the death reporting here in Kuwait. So uh, there is a clear, a clear uh, break in the curve, the epidemic, not the epidemic curve, the, the death curve in Kuwait. It is uh, very strange because it coincided with um, the epidemic curve, the hospitalization curve. So we have death, hospitalization, and epidemic curves, all of them synchronizing the peak, all of them having the same peak. Now, that doesn't happen anywhere. Biologically, that's impossible. There has to be a duration of time, right? And there's the epidemiological uh, part, uh, the serial interval time that takes about seven days, maybe to, to 14. And then you have also the, the duration, the distribution of the durations of hospitalization. Now, in Kuwait, they all coincided. Okay. Now, uh, that raises a lot of red flags, okay, uh, as to what's happening to reporting that. But again, uh, it could be, it could be because. Uh, other countries are reporting problems in how to define uh, COVID death. Okay, it could be because of that, but the the, the curve breaks uh, in a, in a unusual way. So that brings me to selection bias. Um, the the ministry announced not testing isolated areas. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here it begs the question: uh, How is the the breakout? Sorry, the outbreak in those areas being tracked. If we're not swapping, uh, if we're not testing, uh, then we're not registering anything, right? Yeah. Now, uh, the uh, what they said was that uh, they want some sort of uh, policy that supports community, um, long-term community uh, immunity. Okay, natural immunity. Uh, but again, uh, we don't know if that's achieved if we don't have uh, so prevalence data, if we don't have uh, testing. So then if we try to make sense of that, when we talk about the cases that are being reported daily, okay, one thing comes out, one thing comes up, bias in reporting. So this is a clear selection bias. and. We see it, uh, so uh, it's reflected or projected on, for example, calculation of the effective reproduction number or the time varying reproduction number, because the time varying reproduction number currently is calculated in a naive way. But whatever is being confirmed is being considered as, you know, what's truly happening. So that's one. Uh, um, this, this, the second one is uh, the, infection fatality rate, okay? Um, we don't think the infection fatality rate is homogeneous. Uh, we think it's different, okay? Uh, we don't have any data on that. There is no reporting. We, we try to, you know, uh, uh, literally beg our colleagues to work on this, okay? And analyze it and try to use sort of prevalence data just like any other countries, uh, give us a, a, an estimate on the IFR in Kuwait uh, and the demographic uh, distribution of it. That way, the models can make sense of death. Right. So, in terms of how COVID death is being, uh, you know, classified currently, I don't want to say vague. It's really unclear. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, and it would be an issue for, you know, the parameters you enter into the model. Yeah. Um, thank you. There is a question from you, for you from uh, our second speaker, Ahmed. He says, why does the model predict a second peak um, of death in September? Okay, so that's close to what I just said. So we don't think there, the death peaked. We don't think it peaked okay. at all, right? It, and that's mainly because of the... 
you know, the, 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 what we're observing is that all curves are coinciding at the peak, and that shouldn't happen. Okay. okay. So, and we have okay. isolated areas that are we're not getting reports of. So, uh, we don't think we got the first peak in that. Now, why is it peaking? So, um, the current data just past the um, past the first stage of reopening. Okay, um, the model is being recalibrated. Okay, to capture the dynamics. The population currently is completely susceptible. We have our estimate is four percent, but we need some uh, seroprevalence studies to confirm four percent maximum immunity. So. Um, that means there's still a long way to go, okay? Four percent. If we were to, yeah. Uh, okay. So again, this needs confirmation for field studies, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, if we were to uh, follow a policy of community or um, say community immunity, right? Uh, then the, the the epidemic has a long way to go, and with an infection rate of at least five percent, you will see a number close to that. Uh, but again, these are two months' uh, predictions. So surely, within a month time, it will recalibrate, okay, uh, to either lower or not. So currently, the consensus is 0.5 to 1 percent is the uh, K, uh, sorry infection fatality rates. Okay, uh, a lot of studies are published about this. Okay, there are places where you have lower infection rate, uh, sorry, if, if, infection fatality rate, but the consensus is 0.5 to 1. So uh, it's really a, a simple calculation. You don't need modern approach. You just multiply that by, uh, what, 90, 96% of the population uh, with age structure uh, 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 considered, and you get a number around that. So it's because of also reopening. Okay, um, thank you for that. So um, we have a related question or somewhat related from Barak. Um, so his question is, do we have an established groundwork for national surveys in Kuwait, uh, like weighted representative samples, um, something similar to the NHANES data structure in the US, which can make it easy to do zero zero uh, prevalence random testing? So that would be nice if that was available. Um, I'm not aware of that, but um, uh, Dr. Abdullah, do you know of anything? Uh, if there is, I'm not aware of. Uh, yeah. Chances are there isn't. So uh, maybe yeah. there are people out there who are trying to get, um, you know, the teams at the ministry to, you know, to do that. But I'm not. I'm not aware of it. Uh, I know the WHO have their own. A freely available system with training okay but mm -hmm. yeah as far as i know i don't i mean i'm not aware of anything okay so there's a question um from a professor asa he says what is the basis of the r naught equals three in initializing the model how does this affect the model prediction given most models predictions depend on the initiation input values and have you tried different values right yeah, good question um well the current range for r naught uh is somewhere between 1.5 to 3.5 uh there is reason to believe that it's toward the upper end of that range but that that really depends on uh, a lot of uh, variables, so it depends on the population and all of that. So um, now um, I, I did say that we uh, basically jumpstart the simulations from three, but what I didn't say is that we covered the whole range. We we picked randomly from 1.5 to 3.5. The MLE framework, the maximum likelihood uh, estimate, is robust to that. So. No matter what you pick for a start, uh, it always gives you that uh, ultimate result. So, it, uh, it's, it, I mean, again, this is the standard in the field is just to, to use MLE. And now, uh, MLE uh, or the maximum likelihood uh, estimate uh, looks for a, a minimum of the negative 
uh, likelihood function. Okay. Now, uh, sorry, a maximum the negative li likelihood function. Uh, the idea uh, we're trying to fit that model to the data we have. So no matter what we pick for uh, R naught from 1.5 to 3.5, the data always falls around that 1.58. Okay. Uh, if we were to take the uh, infection and incubation periods at two and three. Okay. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, the second or next question we have is uh, from Tamara. Which of these future models are currently in progress and when can we expect them to be made available? Um, okay, so one now is, uh, has been submitted, which is the uh, meta population. So I expect it to be available within a month time. Um, the other two are work in progress uh, with the ministry. So that might might take a bit longer, uh, but as soon as um, uh, we have it ready, uh, we plan to uh, put it on uh, one of the, uh, you know, either medical archive or bio archive. So it, 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 it will be longer than a month for the other ones. Okay. Sounds like you have a lot of work. Good luck with that. We look forward to uh, reading the papers. Thank you so much. You so much. There's uh, one more question for you, Dr. Abdullah, from Suzy. She says, why is collecting seroprevalence data for this model important, I'm guessing? Very good. Uh, that ties into the... Uh, the question about death and why death is, uh, we're expecting a high death. Uh, we want to get an estimate on the infection fatality rate. That's really important for our model. So, and remember fitting uh, is mostly based on hospitalization data and death data, right? So uh, infection fatality rate is important for us to uh, get a handle on the, um, uh, the death data and how uh, well the, the the death in the model and how it's fitted to the reported death. So yeah, zero prevalence is important for our, our IFR. Uh, plus, uh, of course, the um, the immunity of the population. Okay. Um, there's uh, one more question for you, Dr. Abdullah. It's from Dr. Lari. Um, is there a consensus about a Kuwait-specific prevalence rate above which containment interventions are not feasible? And if so, is there consensus over, over whether or not Kuwait hit that threshold already? I sure hope not, but I hope you have a better answer. Okay. So, um, no, we haven't. I don't think we've hit it, okay? Uh, yeah. If you run just simple models, and uh, you might get scared of what you're going to see, okay? Uh, but most of the, you know, most of these models out there are, you know, based on homogeneous mixing, and they're not considering all of the population heterogeneities, whether age, demographics, and so on. So um, I don't think we've hit that. Uh, I don't know about the consensus in Kuwait, but uh, I've seen this discussed uh, elsewhere. Okay, so uh, I, at least there's one publication. And uh, I'm not sure in which country about that. Uh, they, they, you know, they're trying to basically, um, you know, focus on okay, what sort of interventions we should use? Uh, are we at a point where interventions won't work? Um, but no, I don't think there's a consensus in Kuwait. I don't think we're even close. Like I said, I think we're at four percent. So I could be wrong, and I'm happy to be wrong. Um, but yeah, I think no. We're not at that no, stage. For all of our sakes, I hope you're right about this. It's a terrifying thought. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have one question for um, for Ahmed Burbaya. It's from Hamid. The question is, Ahmed, have you noticed any positive effect for the lockdown by analyzing the international models? All of the predictions for the international models went down after the, the lockdown, okay. uh, except for one model, IHME, 
uh, they, their prediction went up. And <clears throat> uh, their explanation is this phenomena of lockdown fatigue. The longer a lockdown is, the, yeah. the more tired the population gets. And then after the lockdown, they, they rush to go outside and there's a surge in cases, which we may have seen or might just be seeing uh, more Kuwaitis being tested post lockdown. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. No, I think I think you're right because um, I mean, look at looking at Google mobility data from all over the world. Like I've seen the data from the U.S., um, New York, New Jersey, and other places. Um, I believe the title of the article was "What Lockdown or What um, You Know Social Distancing." People are moving, people are tired, fatigued of uh, you know keeping their distance. So um, yeah, I think it's it's an issue everywhere, not just in Kuwait. So I'd like to thank um, the two speakers, Dr. Abdullah Shimiri and Ahmed Bubeya, um, for their talks today. It was really interesting, uh, very enjoyable. So thank you. And I'd like to thank all the attendees for taking the time, you know, out of their evening and joining us. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session and found it useful. And we hope to have more sessions with all of you in the future. And last but not least, I must thank the KFAS emergency response team for their amazing work behind the scenes and, put, and putting all of this together and creating the different, you know, sub teams working on different things. I think they've been doing a really great job. I'd like to thank. Um, Dr. Adnan and Dr. Amani and um, Dalal Hashash and Shihab for his IT support and um, for everything. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, it was a pleasure to moderate the session today. Um, hopefully, we'll have a you know slightly more positive um, session the next time we meet. Thank you so much. Good.